Hey kids, are you ready for story time? Mm. Ow. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Ember's Reading Room. Today we continue our ongoing journey through My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland and illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories are Flowers for the Mare's Table and George the Rescue. Both by Rosemary Bromley. Ooh. Also, I've noticed something after editing all of these. We seem to be bouncing back and forth between two authors near the end here. Well, there are a total of four authors, but Anna Webb has the fewest stories out of any of them, and Margaret Connor has the most. Hmm. Should we move on to the stories? Mm-hmm. By the way, people, if you haven't figured it out yet, I enjoy listening to these stories as much as you do. Flowers for the Mayor's Table. The town hall clock struck eight as Mrs. Green unlocked her flower shop. The pale sunshine cast shadows on the pavement. The sky was blue. It was going to be a lovely spring day. She smiled at her Siamese cat, Hilo. He purred loudly and rubbed himself against her legs. Hilo and his mistress went everywhere together. Mrs. Green looked up at the flags flying from the town hall. I'm glad it's a fine day, she thought. At that moment, a red van turned into the street and stopped outside the flower shop. Here we are, Mrs. Green, said the driver. Boxes and boxes of fresh flowers. Where shall I put them? In the workroom, please, answered Mrs. Green. And followed by Hilo, she led the way to the back of the little shop. The cat sat watching her unpack the boxes and carry the flowers to the bowls of water waiting for them in the shop. Look, Hilo, she said, mimosa and carnations from France. Hilo twitched his nose at the sweet-smelling blossoms and carefully washed his paws. Soon the shop was filled with the color of tulips, daffodils, roses, lilac, stately white lilies, small blue gentians, sprays of orchids, and simple little bunches of primroses and violets. Promptly at nine o'clock, the shop door opened and a lady came in. Good morning, Mrs. Green. I do hope that I'm not too early. How lovely your flowers are. We're quite ready for you, said Mrs. Green. It's a long time since the mayor entertained foreign visitors, isn't it? Yes, it is, answered Miss Jones. There will be important guests from France, Switzerland, and Holland, and many other people as well. And to think that my flowers will be there to greet them, murmured Mrs. Green to herself. Miss Jones gave her order briskly, and as the last bunch was packed carefully into her car, she turned to Mrs. Green. I shall have finished arranging the flowers by eleven o'clock. Would you like to come and see them before the guests arrive? Oh, yes, I would very much, said Mrs. Green. You won't mind if Hilo comes, will you? He walks very well on his leash. Miss Jones laughed. I shall be delighted to see you both. I'll meet you at the town hall at 11 o'clock. Goodbye. Right on time, Hilo and Mrs. Green climbed the steps of the town hall. There you are, called a friendly voice, and Miss Jones came quickly forward. Come along and see your flowers. The luncheon room is in here said Miss Jones. Hilo stalked through the door in front of Mrs. Green. Portraits hung from the walls. Silver and glass glittered everywhere, but the flowers were brightest of all. In honor of each guest, there were flowers from his homeland. A bowl of mimosa and carnations for the Frenchman, blue gentians for the gentleman from Switzerland, tulips and hyacinths for the Dutchman, and in front of the mare was a simple but perfect bouquet of primroses and violets. Mrs. Green smiled. I have never seen my flowers look so beautiful, she said. Come along, Hilo. Home we go. Well, that was a nice story about flowers and how they were different flowers for each country, at least associated with the people from those countries. Also, Hilo. Yes, it's quite literally capital H, I, dash, capital L, O. Very cute kitty in the pictures. And it looks like they're using that kind of sponge technique for the backgrounds again. Because when they need more detailed work for, like, these branches in front and the flowers, then it's more like a brush ink technique. You just said that they used it more for the backgrounds, and the flowers that you're pointing to are more in the foreground. Yeah, but also these are in the same plane as her, 
Also, Lars seems to have used some of the sponge technique on the cat for the brown you see in Siamese. Also, in case no one's keeping track, this is the color artist again. <laughs> I don't know. The drawing might have given it away. Yeah, yeah, good point. And there's also this nice picture up in the corner of the kitty looking over the edge of the table at the place settings. Very cute. Also, actually matching quite well because... I know those are carnations, so those have to be mimosa. These are blue, so those are the gentians. And then that's hyacinth. And so that's a very interesting variety of tulip. That's one of the fancy varieties that has the scalloped edges instead of the more rounded edges. And then the primroses and violets at the far end. Yes, I like flowers. We both like flowers a lot. They're very pretty. The only problem I have here is she has all those lilies in there, and cats are highly, highly susceptible to being damaged by lilies. Mm. But that may not have been known at the time this book was created. Mm. No poem this time. Well, we had two stories in a row with poems last time, if I recall correctly. Okay, now George to the rescue. Who's George and what's he rescuing us from? Hmm, boredom, I'm guessing. The winter sky was gray, and the wind howled as George, the steam engine, raced through the Canadian countryside. With smoke and sparks flying, he was going as fast as he possibly could and feeling very pleased with himself, for George had just passed his rival, Dennis the diesel engine. Every day, somewhere along the track to Three Rivers Station, the two trains met and each tried to race the other home. To George's disgust, Dennis nearly always won. Thinks he's going to beat me again today, chortled George. Well, I'm going to get there first this time. Looks as though we are in for a blizzard, said the fireman, as he shoveled coal into the steam engine's furnace. Yes, I shan't be sorry to get home, shouted the driver. At that moment, there was a shrill whistle and Dennis rushed past George. George groaned. Oh dear, he's done it again. I shall never win, he moaned. Nippy trains, those diesels, said George's driver. But I would much rather have George. He has never let us down. George felt much better. The next day, it was snowing hard as George's driver and fireman drove him out of his shed into the yard. We have been taken off our usual run today, said the fireman, and blew on his hands to keep them warm. We are going up to the mountains. There is a village up there which has been cut off for days by the snow. We are going to take food and supplies to them. If we can get through, he added. I'll get through, said George to himself. I may not be all that fast, but I am strong. As he was coupled to two trucks full of provisions, George glanced across at Dennis, who was waiting for his driver. Race you home again tonight, George? asked the diesel jauntily. I have more important things to do today, said George. We are going to the rescue of a village. And before Dennis could utter another word, George gave a loud whistle and steamed out of the yard. The snow was falling heavily, but George pushed it in front of him and the cheery glow from his fire brightened the dark morning. We shall soon branch off onto the single track up the valley to the mountains, said the driver. Then we shall not be far from Gorge Tunnel. Through the valley, with a snow-covered forest on one side and a frozen lake on the other, puffed George. I wish I came up to the mountains every day, he thought. As though he knew what George was thinking, the fireman said, There's nothing to beat an engine like George when it comes to mountain work. There's the tunnel ahead, shouted the driver. The village is just on the other side. George's whistle echoed through the valley as he roared in. The tunnel was very dark and very long, but then a patch of light appeared and came nearer and nearer. Out of the mountain came George, the trucks rattling behind him, and there, by the side of the track, was a crowd of people, waving and shouting. George slowed down and stopped. We heard you coming up the valley, shouted someone. Hooray! yelled the villagers. In the whole of Canada, there was not a happier or prouder engine than George. Canada, huh? Cool. I thought you were going to go Canada, eh? I was trying to, but my mouth didn't work. I think I'm going to go with that picture right there. <laughs> this nice, big, long 
panorama of George going across the mountains over to the village. You're lucky this book is so beat up because we have to put the pages very flat for you to do that. I was mostly just thinking of this section on this side. And there's a picture down here of the diesel engine and George. So I'm not quite sure of the difference between the two now. The diesel engine is probably faster and better for passengers, but a coal engine might work better up in the mountains. I really don't know how it is nowadays. We might have even better stuff that works really well in mountain territory as well. Also, another thing on this panorama is you actually see what the front plow is actually for. See how it's pushing away the snow off the tracks? Mm-hmm. That's one of the things it was designed to do. That and be a cattle guard. Also, they did a wonderful job of using the green to highlight stuff. Like the sky and the train itself for the two color drawings here. In there you see the driver waving out the back there. Though, what's really interesting is it's described two people being in the cabin. In the text, but you only see one there. The fireman, which I'm guessing is the person who controls, who takes care of feeding the engine coal and the driver who takes care of driving the train also people go like why do you need to drive a train it's on tracks well it's how fast the train goes that's what the driver takes care of because if you go too fast going around corners the train will go off the tracks also you need someone to be able to slow the train down in case of any sort of blockage mm -hmm. like cattle or people or a rock slide also, it's interesting that the driver is waving towards the reader when we can clearly see the villages in the other direction. Because there's the village and the people over there, but the driver's out waving towards the reader. Hmm. I see the point. So what do you think of this story? Cute. Probably very Thomas the Tank Engine if I had ever watched more than a few seconds of that just to see Ringo Starr. And the drawing over here, it reminds me of that as well. When he's sitting next to the diesel engine. This is one of those stories that's all about the living guy who could. The common theme with trains, apparently. Apparently. So, shall we move on to the poem? We shall. Said a snail to a caterpillar he knew. I don't know what to do. My shell is full of holes and the rain keeps coming through. Said the caterpillar to the snail with a sigh. I'm the one that ought to cry. I've got so many feet. I have hundreds of shoes to buy. Okay. Interesting. Because, yes, caterpillars have lots of feet, but why does the snail shell have so many holes in it? Yeah, why? Because that's not... How those shells work. No. I should know. I see a lot of them at work now. <laughs> lots of rains cause them to come out everywhere. But the drawing is nice and cute. And it's the two-color style here. So I wonder if the artists who do the illustrations for the stories also do the illustrations for the poems that are on their pages. Hard to say because they don't give page-by-page page credit to the artists, only to the authors. And they don't even list the authors on the page. You have to go to the back of the book to see which author did which story. Because that's all by page number. Because the list of stories in the front has the names of the stories and what page they're on. And the back of the book has the authors and what pages their stories are on. Hmm. Yeah, I have a feeling since they only list two illustrators and those authors. I have a feeling the authors also wrote some of the poems and the illustrators did the drawings. So it's really interesting. So this has been My Bedtime Book of Two Minute Stories, edited by Rosemary Garland, illustrated by Tony Escott and Sally Wellman. Today's stories were Flowers for the Mare's Table and George to the Rescue, both written by Rosemary Bromley. Thank you for listening. We're getting down to the end here. I know there's some people who are kind of doing a countdown and... I think we do have an even number of stories, but we are getting down to the end. The good news is we have lots of other videos already up for other stories and other authors. Also, I still have a lot of children's books, so we will have a change of uh, venue after this book is done. Boy, do she have a lot of children's stories. It doesn't.
And that's after I thin them out eight or ten times. Hmm. So let's see. We talked about other videos. We talked about more books. Did you get a copy of this book yet? Check for the Amazon link. Totally unrelated? Feel like going shopping? Check out the Ebates link. Standard format disclaimer. Amazon and Ebates are not sponsors of or in any way affiliated with Ember's Reading Room or any content on the Lux Analysis channel. Thanks again for listening.